Right, hello everybody and welcome to our webinar today on women and leadership. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have over 300 people from all around the world due to join the session today uh, and we welcome you all to this discussion. My name's Gemma Kay, I'm a member of the business development team here at the school. Um, and to frame our discussion today, I'll shortly be passing over to Professor Sue Dobson, um, who will be leading the session. Um, following this, we'll have a little bit of an uh, overview of some of the programmes that we offer that, that may be of interest to you. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, Professor Dobson is Academic Director for our Women Transforming Leadership Programme. Uh, she's also the Programme Director for our Diploma in Organisational Leadership and a faculty member of our executive MBA. Uh, so without further ado, um, over to you, Sue. Okay, thank you very much. I'm delighted to uh, talk about this very important topic. Um, I'm going to spend about 15 to 20 minutes uh, talking through some high-level themes that are emerging from existing research about women in leadership. Then begin to think a bit uh, about what can uh, what needs to happen in order for this situation to change? What can organisations do to help? And really importantly, what can women do to help in this particular space? And I have to warn you that um, the research, uh, as we're about to discuss it, uh, offers very high level themes and is also quite Western oriented. And I think there's an awful lot that we can do uh, um, in terms of uh, increasing the depth of research and the quality of the research in this particular space. Nonetheless, it is important to acknowledge what is known. So if we begin to think a little bit about leadership studies, um, most generally when we're talking about leaders, we often speak about them in a, a genderless way. And that's led to uh, a kind of view that leadership studies is really purely about male leaders, and of course that isn't true. And researchers need to spend a little bit more time thinking about uh, what really is the difference between leading if you are a man and leading if you are a woman. Um, clearly we also know that there's been a lot of socio-economic change, which means that diversity is needed in the workplace. Um, and if you look at that literature on the evidence about women and leadership, you'll see that there are some themes, which is one, women's leadership styles are, are quite different, not quite different, but they are different to men's. But women tending to have a more transformational leadership behavioural style, by which uh, we mean less transactional, so not really focusing on exchange, but having a, perhaps a, a more subtle approach to leading change, which I'll come on to. And there is some increasing evidence that women's participation on boards in particular may improve financial and social performance. So those are some of the debates that are around in that particular literature. There's been interesting research on leaders and entrepreneurs, female leaders and female entrepreneurs, and the consensus is that they face quite similar challenges. Um, again, a higher order theme from the work is that female leaders appear somewhat weaker in terms of strategic thinking and developing a vision. And we can debate and discuss what that means, but that is a clear theme within the, the literature. The glass ceiling, which was a term we're familiar with, uh, still persist. And uh, there's been a discussion shift in that literature to look at the institutional barriers and facilitators that might influence women's participation. So let me get uh, a little bit more into the, the, the detail. And here uh, on this particular slide, you'll see an overview, uh, really, which is around um, the numbers of women participating in uh, senior leadership roles. Um, again, not to read out the slides because you can see them, but it, it is, I think, a slight disappointing picture, the slight improvement uh, of participation, but actually it's a relatively... Uh, disappointing uh, picture. And women are most likely to lead or hold leadership roles in education, social services and healthcare. Uh, areas of occupations where um, you know there's a kind of a stereotype around caring and, and so forth, but women most likely tend to do better in those particular contexts. 
and lower percentages of women entering high roles where you're in, in sort of selling, mining, quarrying, construction. Often occupational territories associated with, with, with more masculine or male stereotypes. Um, so in that sense, it's not uh, a particularly uh, glowing um, uh, sort of picture. Um, and again, this slide uh, around country variations, we begin to see some interesting uh, figures here. The EU women hold 26% of top jobs in businesses. Um, but again, if we look at uh, Eastern European, Russia, etc., um, we, we see some very interesting uh, statistics here that the percentage of women are higher in that particular parts of the, the world. And in, indeed, Russia um, tops that global league table with 40% of senior roles held by women. And Japan, India, Germany remain bottom uh, of those rankings. So this, you know, when you begin to dig a little bit deep in terms of country variations, there's some interesting questions about why those patterns might emerge. Um, and if we think about, again, from this very helpful Grant Thornton uh, report in 2015, some trends, they highlight four key trends regarding the career paths of, of men and women who hold top leadership positions. Um, the theme of parenthood and family care requiring women to make more sacrifices in their careers uh, continues. Um, women are twice as likely than men to report gender bias in their interactions at work. Um, and women who hold senior management positions are more likely than men to work in management support functions uh, rather than those core leadership roles, HR for example. Um, and some interesting issues around men and women differing in their networking style. And I'll come to, to comment on that a little bit later in terms of what we might begin to do differently as women working in this space. The slides here uh, really begin to um, elaborate the comments that I've made earlier about uh, proportions of senior management um, positions that women hold globally. Um, again, you'll see the trends that I commented on. And I think this is a very interesting slide here around the countries where, uh, again, you see the, the sort of Eastern European uh, influence here uh, in terms of uh, being a bit more of a success story compared to many other parts of the world. So let's then begin to dig deep a little bit around the contextual influences um, that might uh, lead to different leadership styles uh, being practiced. Um, we know, um, it's not just true for women actually, that context determines opportunities and barriers to career advancements more generally. Um, if, we're, if we're focusing on women, then the previous slides talk, uh, speak very clearly about the importance of the influence of national cultural context, either helping or perhaps getting in the way. Um, the role modelling that one gets in, in terms of family becomes very important. And of course, the impact of behaviours in organisational context uh, being important to influence about building confidence within women to step up to engage in these senior leadership roles. So um, context uh, emerges uh, incredibly important both at a national level but also at an organisational level. So the organisational culture, uh, how diversity is discussed in organisations, uh, how appraisal systems are managed, for example, are they alert to diversity issues, all those you know, good uh, practices in terms of HR, if they're there in the context, clearly help. If they're not, clearly don't. Um, and we know that... Um, all managers actually, but particularly female managers, the research uh, uh, highlights, tend to adapt their style to organisational context. So if you are in a context where you only see uh, transactional type behaviour, tough politics, then that for many women will put them off engaging in leadership work. Um, so I want to stress here the importance of, of the organisational context is it a receptive context for women to really step up and join? Um, what can we do to build those contexts that support, um, support success? There's a big debate on this literature about gen gender quotas on corporate boards. Uh, again, this slide talks about um, you know, the laws that have come in that uh, 
really underpin the importance of quotas. A um, great deal of debate whether this is fair, whether this is helpful, whether women indeed appreciate um, quotas being in place and attributing that to their, their success. Um, and there's some really interesting uh, issues, uh, some research rather, on um, board performance. Is corporate performance enhanced by increasing diversity, particularly with respect to increasing the number of women on corporate board? Frankly, in the research there's mixed findings. There are two camps. One is that companies perform better when they have more female directors. The second is that by imposing gender quotas on board composition, their corporate value can be destroyed. So one of the uh, interesting uh, debates that we might have in this webinar is, is you know, what, to what extent do you agree with that? Is quota uh, an intervention that will support this area or will it not? Um, let me try and summarise then before I make some more general remarks about what we can do to, to help in this space. What does the research say about facilitators and barriers to women's career advancement? The facilitators are, again, uh, clearly themed on this slide, and I've already mentioned some of them. But organisational culture and a leadership commitment to nurture female talent is clearly critical and clearly helps. Women helping other women. Um, the extent to which uh, networks are available, events are convened within organisations, clearly help women. Government intervention in the research clearly is helping, although there is this debate around quotas that we've discussed. Um, accepting that there are many different ways to lead and that we don't just need one style and that perhaps feminine qualities, of which the stereotype is to be good listener, to be caring, uh, to uh, be empathetic, um, that they are valued they are valued, but they are not just purely associated with women. Um, there's some interesting uh, work uh, around um, different contexts and women having career uh, advantage, and there's some interesting work that appearance may slightly, and only slightly because the research isn't that strong, facilitate career advancement. Um, so those are some of the facilitators. Uh, of course, there's much more work that's robust empirically in terms of barriers. And the barriers are the, these sort of structural barriers and discrimination, gender roles and stereotypes. Uh, and these barriers are observed uh, in profit and non-profit organisations. Another barrier is lack of access to networks and organisational sponsor, sponsorship. Um, women are either over-mentored, in other words, you get so much advice and etc. you don't know what to do with it, or they're under-mentored. There doesn't seem to be a kind of middle ground that we, 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 we consistently are able to achieve. So we need more work in this space about what kind of networks would really support women, what kind of mentorship and coaching would support women. Um, and we have this, this notion of uh, the glass cliff, we talk about the glass ceiling, which I think is well known, but the glass cliff is really giving women jobs where the likelihood of failure is significantly greater. Modesty and invisibility undermines female career advancement. Uh, it is well known that to be successful in any career, actually, about 30% of your success is how good you are in terms of performance. About 40% is around the networking that you do. 40% is around, I'm sure there's 10% missing there, but anyway, 40% is around how visible <laughs> is what you do to the organisation. And clearly, um, women in the research terms, uh, it's suggested that they don't do so well in that particular area. Interesting barriers around uh, the imposter syndrome. Um, this is the notion that uh, many uh, work, uh, many leaders do suffer with, but women in particular suffer with. And that is the notion that you feel you're going to be caught out, that you feel um, in this leadership role you uh, are surprised that you're here and you lose confidence because of that feeling. Um, a really interesting barrier in the research that uh, we found was uh, in terms of women working for other women. 
um, it does seem as a theme that uh, the appraisal process, when women um, appraise younger women or uh, women um, at middle management level, for example, that they're harder and tougher on them than they are when they appraise men. And I think there's some very interesting questions around that theme of the research. Why does that seem to happen? So that is a, a, a kind of um, just general review of the research that's around. Um, and it's always best in designing programs, particularly when you're trying to support um, women's leadership, to build on what is known. And I'm sure that you'll agree with me that actually the research in this area is, is rather patchy and rather thin, and that actually we do need to kickstart some more research, particularly around um, non-Western contexts, particularly around uh, the notion of what leadership styles, what's the variety of leadership styles uh, around um, that we need to understand, particularly for women uh, leaders. Um, so let me just make some more general uh, points then uh, about um, leadership more generally and, and the opportunity that I see for women to contribute. In today's world, uh, we're dealing with incredibly complex, multi-leveled, multifunctional problems as leaders. Um, these problems are almost wicked problems, uh, taking from Keith Grint's uh, typology. They're wicked because it's very hard to know where they stop um, and solving one part of the problem often creates difficulty elsewhere. So we need uh, generally um, different kinds of leaders to help us deal with these very complex problems. We need leaders who can cooperate, to collaborate, to bring diverse ranges of skills and perspectives to generate new ideas and approaches and these are very different leadership styles from traditional heroic leaders uh, who are typically male white uh, middle class so we need uh, leaders who are comfortable with ambiguity who are empathetic who invite dissent who are prepared to experiment and in some ways looking at what we know about women's leadership style given that the research is limited, as I've already said, it seems that women are well placed to lead the charge in dealing with these wicked problems. Um, so I think you know, there's a kind of understanding here that the, the, the kind of leadership styles that we see in the research associated with women, women might be incredibly helpful in this moment of very complex, very turbulent times. Um, the second thing um, that I want to say is really about the research. We need more insights and research and more innovative scholarly approaches in this space. As I said, much of the current research continues to focus on the traits of women leaders uh, and that has, I think, an effect of perpetuating traditional models of leadership which is not going to be helpful. So future areas of exploration might be areas where leadership is looked at as a process rather than characteristic of an individual leader. I think we probably need fewer role models. The media-like personalities um, are around. We all respond to stories about how individuals have become successful. Um, the problem is that when you do that, you take insufficient account of context and it usually only offers one way to succeed. Today's women leaders have usually succeeded in a man's world. So behaviours that they advocate are about continuing to do so and what they've done to get that far. There's a danger in just having that particular kind of story. Um, I think we need to have more room to experiment in organisations. Um, women who are flexing their leadership muscle for the first time or trying out new leadership identity are exposed. And that is why women's networks and women's leadership programs are very, very helpful because they provide a supportive environment to test these different behaviours and to receive feedback. And I think the other thing that we need to uh, do is to find more time to talk. Um, there are numerous cultures, numerous organisational contexts 
uh, where there have been different um, experiments of involving women in leadership and we need to share and talk about that and think about what seems to work. I think there's a challenge around quotas. There's a number of arguments, as we've already said, are against quotas and other types of positive discrimination. Um, so I think we perhaps need to think a little bit more about quotas and targets and the impact of those on women's confidence and their ability to experiment in their own space. So what can organisations do? I think we probably need to focus on um, gender balance, not women. A better approach to the problem might be to focus on having more women uh, um, and ha more on having a better balance. So I think let's think about the balance in organisations. We need to measure outputs rather than presence. Despite the uh, ability of technology to facilitate working whenever and wherever we want, most organisations still suffer from a debilitating culture of presentism. So I think we need to think much more about how we measure outputs rather than presence. Um, what can women do? I think it's really important that we as leaders, and all leaders need to think about this, but women in particular, think about purpose. Um, if you're driven by a sense of purpose, then you direct your energies towards what you need to do and what you need to learn in order to achieve this larger goal. Develop our personal networks. Um, the research would suggest that women aren't very good at doing that. Um, women often say to me that they find the idea of networking uncomfortable because they feel inauthentic or they're using people for their own advancement. However, there's more to networking than a traditional transactional model. Think of it as connecting with people who you can help, or who you can bring together to get things done. And then I think finally, I'd like to say, lead like yourself. Um, increasing evidence that um, there are a variety of ways in which to lead. There's no particular recipe for making an impact. Um, so lead like yourself and understand and use your influence. Spend time thinking about how you do make an impact currently and how that might uh, be, be increased. So I think those are some of the um, just general comments that I would make. Um, what we've done in this webinar is, is really look at what is known from the literature. Um, I've already mentioned that that is where uh, we, we start when we design any program. In this space, in the literature, um, there's some disappointment, I think, about the research. But I think there are some things that organisations can do and that women can do more generally. And I'd be delighted to start having a discussion about some of the things, some of the general observations I've made about the research and, and what might help. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. That was incredibly um, interesting. And I'm sure we've all taken a lot from that to reflect on, to think about, um, about how it can help us all in our um, personal careers. Um, we're shortly going to come to a QA. and I, I thought it might be useful at this point to touch on some some of our programs um, that Sue teaches on um, and that can help um, develop your organisations, develop you personally, develop your careers. Um, just, just, yeah, this bit, right. Um, so there's a number of programs at Oxford that uh, that might be of interest to you. Um, one that I'd just like to touch on um, briefly, and I'll, I'll only give a brief overview of, of three particular programs here today, is our Diploma in Organisational Leadership. Um, this is led by Professor Sue Dobson, um, and it's part of our suite of strategic management diplomas, um, which are part-time, assessed, um, and accredited Oxford programmes that focus on different areas of strategic management um, and are delivered over roughly a year where you come to Oxford four times um, for four modules uh, with it, which are each four days long um, and this particular program um, is about providing a, a framework for managing individual and group performance um, focusing on areas such as managing change, culture, um, leadership style, um, all in the context of developing a strategic mindset to bring about growth, change um, and transformation. Um, so as with all these programs that there will be more details on, on the website if that looks like something that could be of interest to you please please have a look please get in touch. Oh, oh 
here we go, right, I thought I lost the slides there a moment. Um, you may be looking for a um, longer um, uh, program, a full degree here at Oxford, um, and for experienced executives, um, I'd, I'd see to look, look closely at our executive MBA. Um, this is delivered twice a year. Um, and is delivered over 21 months uh, where people complete the program on a part-time basis coming to Oxford 16 times um, uh, during those uh, during those months um, for a period of five days um, so students are here together from the Monday to the Friday um, and cover a number of core modules which you can see on the screen now uh, mainly in your first year um, and in your second year, you can choose from a number of electives to, shoot, uh, to shape the executive MBA so, it's, so it suits you. Um, we also have in, uh, international modules. So in the first year, one of our modules is delivered in India. Um, in the second year, the whole group uh, go together to China. Um, and there's also an elective in California um, and also a new elective, which we haven't got on this slide, um, in Cape Town as well. Just to let you know who, who the programme's aimed at, the type of people that come, it's, it's an experienced group, um, so an average of 14 years work experience. Um, the average age on the last programme was 38. Um, we were delighted to have 37% women on, on our last programme. Um, uh, we, we, would, we would like more, but we feel that's um, uh, a good percentage for this group. Um, and it's also a very diverse group, so we'll have lots of different sectors represented, um, but importantly, many different nationalities too. So um, 36 different nationalities on the last programme. You would be expect to be studying um, from people from all over the globe um, and for the programme to have a, a very global approach in its teaching as well. Finally, um, to tell you a little bit more about our Women's Transforming Leadership Programme, which, which Sue touched on, um, and who's the academic director of the programme. Um, this programme is, is a short five-day um, leadership programme and you can see here our next intake commences in October. Um, and this programme is really designed to help you broaden your impact. Um, so it's about gaining further awareness of your personal strengths, um, working out who you are, where you're going and, and how you're, how you're going to make, uh, make a difference. Um, you can see a bit more information on here um, about uh, how you can find out more. And again, there's a video and more information on our website. Um, so I encourage you to, to take a look. Um, this is very much aimed at middle to senior managers. Um, so executives um, who have responsibility for leading others and making important decisions.